Well, good morning, Gateway Church. How are we doing today? Good. Hey, there you go. We got some lively bunch in here. Hey, listen, it's our last Sunday of the year, so I want all the excitement during this service. My name is Charles. I'm one of the pastors here at Gateway Church. We are super excited that you are here with us. You've given us a portion of your morning. Let me be the first one to say this to all the new people. Welcome. We hope that you feel at home today. We have an awesome service planned for you. If you're joining us online, we are super excited to have our Facebook family with us. Hey, listen, do us a favor. Go ahead and spread the word about what's happening here at Gateway Church. You should be able to find the share button at some area on the screen. I don't know. I'm guessing it's going to be on this side. That's my guess. I don't know. Well, you should be able to see it. But again, we're super excited that you've joined us today. Today, we're looking at our, our year theme, Know God, what it means to know God as we recap on the year and see what God has done in our lives. Have we grown deeper in relationship with him? Pastor Tim should be up here shortly, and he'll be sharing a word from God with us. We have an awesome and excellent um, youth, sorry, not youth, but children's program going going on during this time. So feel free if you have any kids here, step out into the atrium. Someone should be able to point you in the direction as to where to check them in. All right, that's all I have for you. I know you guys are like super excited to sing some songs, so I won't, I won't take too much more time. Why don't you go ahead, stand up with me. Sam and the team will lead us in some songs. This is me nodding at that sound. Hey, good morning, church. Why don't we put our hands together this morning as we clap and worship Jesus with more than our hands, but with our whole lives, right? Yeah, yeah. I know you get it. This one thing I'm asking, one thing I'm needing, the moment. This classic, now what I'm seeking. Like it's the air I'm breathing. I want your presence, be on the earth. I'm full of heaven, feel, feel. Really consumes me. I can't get enough, can't get enough of you.
foundation for everything. Man. I love this song because it's so powerful and um, when Pastor Tim emailed me like last week or something like that, I don't know, about choosing songs for this Sunday, he was like, let's sing songs about 
what we've talked about this whole past year, right? Which is knowing God. And I think if we start here, we believe in God, the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit, that he was resurrected and that we can rise again in Jesus. Everything else from there just goes uphill. It's awesome, you know? Just gets better. But our foundation is so solid in that. And when you know that and hold that to be true and build everything else on top of that, it's just, it's amazing, you know, to know that we have this firm foundation in Jesus Christ. Amen. Awesome. Thank you so much for singing. Why don't you go ahead and have a seat? Thanks. Thanks, uh, Sam. Thank you, worship team. God bless you. Good to have you all with us here today on this, the final Sunday of 2018. It's here and it is upon us and looking forward to some great things next year. I should just come on forward. We'll receive your tithes, your giving. This is the last opportunity for you to give in the 2018 income tax year. And if you would like to uh, give, we would uh, just bless you today in doing that. Ushers, go right ahead and just begin to receive that offering and thank you for your final giving of this year towards your uh, income tax, but also in allowing Gateway to be so generous in so many ways throughout this year. We have just loved practicing that kind of generosity. Another thing that I like to do at the end of this year is to thank all of the many volunteers that serve here at Gateway Church throughout the year in so many ways. Uh, it, you can well imagine how many people it takes just to pull off uh, three campuses and five services every single weekend, almost 160 people to make every single Sunday happen uh, around the three campuses. And so we're just so grateful for all of you who serve. If you have served in any way, in any capacity here at Gateway Church, I'm going to invite you to stand right now. Just uh, whoever has a role in serving at Gateway Church, just stand, whether it's a coffee or in the parking lot or whatever it is. Thank you so much for the areas in which you serve. God bless you today. Thank you so much. For those of you who did not stand, why? <laughs> we believe that serving is a part of the kingdom process in terms of our spiritual maturity and development. Let me encourage you, as 2019 in my heart, I believe it's a year of the volunteer. It's a year of the servant's heart for us. And we would love for you to consider where do you fit in a way in which you're not asking for every weekend, not asking for 25 or 30 hours a week. But boy, everybody that has a role to serve here finds their place and they just make Gateway more of their home. And one person that has made that happen more than anyone else is Andy Stevens. How many know Andy? Andy has been serving at Gateway for more than 20 years. When I first came to preach the call to become the pastor of Gateway Church 21 years ago, my two girls were just uh, in kindergarten and grade one, and the very first person that walked up to greet me, I didn't, nobody knew I was, I was preaching the call, nobody knew who I was. I walked in the back doors like everybody else as a perfect stranger, and the first person to greet me was Andy, and he said, hello, and I said, hi. I said, I'm new to this place. I said, can you show me around, and Andy showed me around the whole church, and it took uh, probably 10 minutes until finally he looked at me and winked and he goes you're the speaker today aren't you <laughs> and from there on in there's been hardly a Sunday that Andy hasn't greeted me with a big smile Andy's far more older than you might think and uh, he's well into his 80s and he has come to a time of retirement it's just getting too hard for him to be every single Sunday at the front door of our services every single Sunday and so He's finally hanging up his chair. He's hanging up his, uh, his bin of candy for the kids. And so we have a, a thank you booklet out in the atrium. He was here in the first service, not able to be with us in the second one. It's just too much for him. But he is out in, uh, the booklet is out in there. And before you leave today, boy, it'd be really great if you could just give him a, a, a greeting, just write a little note to him and encourage him and thank him for more than 20 years of showing it all and setting the bar of what it means to be a servant follower leader here at Gateway Church. Let's take a few minutes right now and just uh, get to know one another, say hi to a few people, and we'll be back in about five minutes time.
to him every victory Trust in your promise. I will trust, I will trust, I will trust in you, Lord. I will trust, I will trust, I will trust in your promise. I will trust, I will trust, I will trust in you, Lord. We are humanity, and there is no limit to what we can accomplish together. In other words, we don't need God, do we? What do you know about God? What is He like? How well do you know Him? Think about the word prayer, you know, talking to God. Is it real? Does it matter? Sure it does, if someone is listening. Do you remember how you felt when you were first told you were going to be a dad? What is one thing dads could learn from you? What is one thing you wish you knew better? Centuries ago, God made this promise. I will make myself known in the sight of many nations. Then they will know that I am the Lord. Can the future be different than the past? Can I change, improve, and grow? How can I get stronger in every area of my life? What if a church actually helped you know whether God is real? What if there was a church that helped you change in ways you want to and to develop good friendships with others? What if a church helped you take a step in the right direction? How are things for you financially? Are you in too much debt? Are you barely making ends meet? Are you saving for the future? Are you investing in what really matters? Are you making a difference in the world around you? It all comes down to trust. Know what? Even though you're not sure what to believe or who you can trust, you can know faith again. Know what? Even though you may have hurt others or been hurt by others, you can know forgiveness. Christmas time is here. So how about some joy, hope, love, and peace? Maybe you could use some of those gifts this Christmas.
Well, those are all the series that we got to go through this year as our year theme has been Know God. What does it mean to know God? Well, just before Pastor Tim comes up here and shares a word with us, I want to give you an opportunity to ask yourself these questions with the people around you. Do you feel like you know God better now than you did a year ago? And why or why not? Why or why not? So why don't you go ahead, take about three minutes, get around the people around you and ask yourselves this question. Do you know God better than a year ago. We'll be back in just a short moment. Do you know God? Do you think you know God better than you did a year ago? Hmm, that's a good question. One of the questions that I thought of when I was looking at that again this morning was, how do I know? You know, how do I know? And we're going to look at that a little bit today. As you know, know God has been the theme of our entire year. But I just want to start this morning by saying that it is our intention, and it has been our intention for this entire year, that knowing God would not just be a theme for a year. That knowing God would not just be like, we're just going to compartmentalize this and just set it into this little box of 2018 and say, 2018 is the year of knowing God, and then we'll move on to something else, maybe something more important. Let me tell you, first of all, it's not just for one year. And, and secondly, there's nothing more important. So we hope that ending 2018 and going into 2019, that it's going to be your lifelong theme. It's going to be something that you continue to pursue. And today we are going to go back in time a little bit, here and there, to a year ago when we first introduced our 2018 theme so that we can remind ourselves of where we were and where we've come and where we are now. 
I believe that's the only way to truly be able to know the answer to our discussion question. Have I really gotten to know God better over the last year? Well, as we looked at that question, as we discussed it, I do realize that when you ask a question like that, a pretty loaded one, that it actually leads to other questions. And as we discuss that question, we have to acknowledge that if we're going to ask the question of whether we think we know God better, we have to ask the question like, questions like this. How do we know whether we know someone better? Like what are the signs? What are the markers? What are the evidences that we actually do? You know, anybody, including God. And how do we actually get to know someone better? I mean, if you think about a relationship that you have here, um, whether it's a spouse or, or a, a child or a parent or a family member or a friend, how do you actually get to know that person better? What is needed to do that and how do you pursue it? And here's a really important question. How can we want that? How can we want to know someone better if maybe we don't yet want it enough? I mean, think, think about this. It's not just good enough to say... I need this. It's not even just good enough to say, I know that this is something that's necessary. It's actually necessary for it to be a desire. I want to speak to those of you who are married for a second. If you go home and over lunch today, you turn to your spouse and say, I just want you to know that I, I just want to know you better simply because I know it's the right thing to do. It's not going to be a good day for you. I just want you to know that, okay? I, I got a little secret. You need to want it. And if you don't, something in your want is broken. It needs to be fixed, all right? So we need to want as much as we need to know. We need to want to know. So the question is, what has to change in us in order to do that? And this speaks to this thing called appetites. And we looked at that a year ago. We asked a question that dealt with what we want, what we desire, what we're hungry for, what we're thirsty for. And the question went something like this. How do you develop spiritual appetites? How do you develop them? How can we want something we don't want? How can we desire something we don't desire enough? How can we be hungry and thirsty for something that maybe we're not quite hungry and thirsty for yet enough? Well, as we end this year, I want to ask you another question that's related to that question. And the question is, what do you want to know more than anything? What do you want to know more than anything? Now just stop for a second and just search your heart for a minute. Only you can answer this. But in the depths of your heart, from your core desires, what do you want to know more than anything else? You see, what you have an appetite for is directly related to that. Because what you have an appetite for is what you will want to know more than anything else. And that might be something that you want to think about for New Year's and into next week and into 2019 because this could potentially define what 2019 will be like for you. I don't know what's in store for you, but I do know this. You will likely get what you want. You will likely pursue what you want. So, what do you want to know? Because what you want to know is a direct reflection of your appetites and of your desires. Well, if you remember back to the beginning of this year, if you were with us all year or you were with us for at least part of the year or maybe you were with us at the beginning and took a, a break and now you're back, welcome back. Great to have you here for the end of the year. We hope you stick around. <laughs> But if you remember back at the beginning of this year, if you were here, you will remember that we looked at various types of people and we're going to take another quick look at them again because we want to do a quick evaluation. And we want to ask a question, you know, as we asked back then, what kind of person are you? And then we want to ask the question again because hopefully there's been some change in a good way. We saw that there are skeptics. You know, people who say, yeah, I don't know. I don't really know if God loves me. And then we see negotiators. You know, I want to make a deal with God. I want God to love me on my terms or I want to love him on my terms. And then we have the doubters. I don't really know why would God ever want to love me. I'm not sure if what he said is actually true. I don't know if I could trust it. Then we have those who are fickle, you know, plucking the daisy. I love you. I love you not. He loves me. He loves me not. Today I love him. Tomorrow I might not, you know. 
And then we have those who are selective, you know? They're like, you know, I kind of like the idea of God being part of my life and loving God and Him loving me, but, you know, I have this part of my life that he, it's okay for Him to mess with, and then there's this part of my life, hands off. I want to decide what happens with this part of my life. This can be His, but this is mine. And then we have those who are sold out, who actually can say, I love you, Lord, more than I love myself, or my desires. Now that's a big change, isn't it? That's a big step. Now here's what I'm wondering when we look at these different types of people. When it comes to knowing God, I'm wondering what type of person was I a year ago? What was I most like in that list? What type were you? And whatever type you were, whatever type I was, the question is, are we different now? Have things changed? Have they progressed? Have they improved? Have they become more of what God wants them to be? Do we need to be honest enough to say that maybe we're still struggling with some of the first five more than we want to admit? That maybe we still need some help in those areas in order to truly pursue the last one, which is about being sold out and saying, God, I want to love you more than I love anything else. Well, I want to know how to move from any of those to the last one. And I hope that you do too. I want to learn in 2019 what it means to truly be sold out in a way that loves God more than anything else in the world. And I hope that that's your desire here too today. Well, it all depends, doesn't it? A year ago, Pastor Rick sat in this very same place and he made a statement that I want to park on for a minute. It was a statement that is noteworthy. It is thought-provoking. It is potentially polarizing. Yes, it was that good. Can you believe that? No, I'm, I'm kidding. Most of what Pastor Rick says is really good. He's back there. Yes, you the man, Pastor Rick, you the man. No, I'm in trouble. I'm in trouble. Okay. He thinks I'm being sarcastic. But no, in all honesty, it was a statement that I realized as we were looking at this past year and then, and then looking at what's to come in the next year. I realized we have to go there again. We have to revisit this again because I'm, I'm not there yet. I still need to ask this que the questions that come from this statement. Here's what he said. Everything depends on the quality of your relationship with God. Now, I want you to think about that for a minute. Everything depends on that. So just, just think. Think about what that could include. The success of my relationships. The success of my career. The effectiveness of my work. The use of my time. The depth of my character. The integrity of my choices the righteousness of my actions, the very meaning of my life, all depends entirely on the quality of my relationship with God. So when I think about those areas, when I think about my relationships, my career, my work, the use of my time, my character, my morality, my choices, how I reflect the character of Christ in my life, how are those things doing? Because those are the markers. Those are the ways we know what our relationship with God is like. And if you are struggling in some of those areas, or some of those areas need some attention or some help or some work, then I would suggest to you that maybe your relationship with God needs some more attention. That maybe we need to pursue that, and that that will help us to retool some of these areas. Because how many of you know you can't just work on the branches of the tree and hope that the tree will be healthy? You've got to go to the root of the tree, right? So just before Jesus was betrayed and crucified, he spent some time in sincere, honest, focused, and heartfelt prayer to his Father. <clears throat> and you'll find this in John chapter 17. And in this prayer, he made a statement right in the middle of it. Now, he stated a lot of things in this prayer, and it was a fantastic prayer that is such an insight into the heart of the Father and the character of God. But right in the middle of this prayer, in John chapter 17, Jesus made this statement. This is eternal life, that they know you, 
the only true God and Jesus Christ whom you have sent. This is eternal life. We sort of made that a bit of a theme verse for 2018. And that is why we need to park on it one more time at the end of 2018. Because this is such a loaded and weighty statement. And I don't know if you've thought about it a few times throughout the year. Or maybe we forgot about it. I don't know. But I do know this, that so much hangs on it. Not only because Jesus said it, but also because he is revealing something here that is true, not only for today, but forever. And a lot of things are dependent on it. On this statement hangs the entire message of Jesus. So if you believe the gospel, the good news about Jesus and about salvation, it is dependent entirely on what Jesus said here. That eternal life is found in knowing him. The purpose for your life, the reason that you are on this planet, the reason that Jesus came to this planet like we celebrated at Christmas, the reason you were created, the reason you are here today, and the possibility of eternal life itself is entirely dependent on whether you know God and Jesus whom he sent. Did you ever think about that? I mean, all of it's dependent on that. All of it hangs on that. So the question about how well we know him and how deeply we know him and how much we know him is so important because everything to do with salvation and eternal life and purpose and meaning and, and, and plans of God for us and his will all comes down to knowing him. Well, I don't know about you, but I would like to know that everything I believe and everything I hold to and everything I live and everything I experience and everything I will experience for all of eternity is actually real and actually true. How many of you are with me on that? You'd like to know that what you believe is true. I mean, what's the alternative? Seriously. I mean, it's nice. It would be great to know for sure, right? That what you believe, what you hold to, what you live and what you experience isn't a lie, right? What do you think? I'd like to know it's true as well. Here's what Jesus is saying when he made that statement. He's saying the only way you can know that what you believe and hold to and live and experience is true is to know him. That's the only way to know. You won't necessarily solve all the problems. You won't work out all the details because Jesus did not say this is eternal life that you have good theology. He didn't say this is eternal life that you take Pastor Tim's Foundations and Faith course. I can't believe he didn't say that, but he didn't. <laughs> he didn't say, this is eternal life, that you hear every single message that Pastor Rick speaks on Sundays, or that you take this course, or go to that class, or that you know all the answers that anyone would ever ask you in the Bible, you know? What's this dilemma? Did Adam have a belly button? And if so, why? other than, boop, you're done. You know what I mean? Like, seriously, I have no idea. But I know this. He did not say any of those things. He said this is eternal life, that you know God. Hmm. Let me ask you a question. Is there anyone here who knows my wife, Patty? <clears throat> Where have the rest of you been? Seriously. Is there anyone here who knows my wife, Patty? Just put up your hand. Let me see, all right? Okay, we have Serge. All right, who else? Somebody over on the, okay, Kim, somebody over on this side, Jessica. All right, uh, let me start with Jessica. Jessica, how long have you known my wife, Patty? Nine or ten years. Wow, nine, that's not bad. All right, how well do you know her? Sort of well. <laughs> sort of well, that's good. She's honest, that's great. I mean, nine or ten years is quite a long time, right? But that doesn't necessarily mean you know someone really well, right? Okay, Kim, how about you? How long have you known my wife, Patty? 14 years, even longer. How about that? How well do you know her? Not that well. Well, thank you for being honest, Kim. All right. She'd probably say the same thing because there's a lot of things that have to happen in order to really get to know, even if you'd known her for a while, right? And Sarah, how about you? How long have you known her? Eight. Eight years. So not quite as long. How well do you know her? I call her Aunt Patty. Aunt Patty. All right. Yeah, that's good. Yeah, that's... Okay, that's good. Well, yes, you are young enough to be our nephew. Don't remind me of that, okay? Don't remind me of that. Um, the reality is this. Whether you've known my wife for eight years or 14 years or 12 or 10 or anything in between, there was somebody in the first service who, who, had, who was here before we came and has known my wife for like 21, 22 years, however long that was. And it was like, you know, a long time. But even that person said, yeah, I kind of know her 
fairly well, I guess. The reality is this. In spite of how long you've known her, and in spite of how well you know her, I'm telling you, you don't know her as well as I do. <laughs> and I have three kids to prove it. Okay? Ew. I just want to apologize to my children who may be in the room or watching this online. Ew. Seriously, Dad, did you go there? Yeah, I did. <laughs> I'm not dead yet. Okay? So here's the thing. I know my wife, Patty. I really, really know her. And it's not just about that. You know what I mean? Like having kids and stuff. It's way more than that. Why? Because I have been with her for more than 30 years. And we spend almost every day together. And we talk with each other more than anyone else. And we actually enjoy being together. And we actually spend time together. And yes, because we also have an intimate relationship with each other. Now, I want you to pause for a second and ask yourself that question that you know is about to be asked in your heart. Do I know God? Did you hear all the things I just said of why I know my wife the way I do? To know is to truly experience. To know is to truly be in actual relationship with. It's personal. It's intimate. Obviously, it doesn't just mean sexual. It's far more than that. It is authentic, and it is real, and it's meaningful, and it's deep. And based on that, the question is, how well do I know God? And is he satisfied with how much I know him? Or does he want me to know him more? We're not done knowing God, are we? We're not there yet. We said it at the beginning of this year, and we'll say it again. Knowing God is about coming alive to Him through Jesus and genuinely surrendering ourselves to Him. Let me say that again. Knowing God is about coming alive to God through Jesus and about genuinely surrendering ourselves to Him. And, and that brings more questions up. Can I describe my relationship with God this way? Is it something that has truly come alive this year? Or does it still need to come alive? Have I genuinely surrendered myself to Him? Or are there some areas in which I still desperately need to surrender? I want 2019 to be a year when my relationship comes alive with God more than it ever has before. I want 2019 to be a year when I genuinely surrender every area in my life to God more than I ever have before. And I want to ask you, what do you want for 2019? Because what you want is what you're going to run after, and it's probably what you're going to get. Now, I want you to remember, we're going to take another quick look at something that we looked at at the beginning of the year. And it was um, about uh, the creation. When God created Adam and Eve, and we know what happened, they enjoyed close relationship and fellowship with God, but then, of course, they fell. They sinned. And when they fell into sin, their relationship was messed up. It was actually sabotaged in so many ways. And that is a picture, of course, of how badly we need Jesus. Jesus came in order to repair that relationship. He came in order to bring us to the Father and show us the Father and bring us back into the relationship that we were meant to have. But sin messed that relationship up for Adam and Eve, and it's been doing that ever since to everyone and anyone. And if you remember, if you were here a year ago, there were specific areas of sin that they, that they had committed and, and that we've all been guilty of. And let's take a quick look at them, all right? There's presumption. I know what's best for my life. There's mistrust. God is not enough. There is disobedience. Yeah, it's not a big deal. There's carelessness. My relationship with God isn't really that important. It's not important enough. And as we saw a year ago, and we need to be reminded of again today, because we have to be warned about it, and we have to, as someone came to me after the first service and said, just because I wash my car doesn't mean I never need to wash it again. We need to wash the car again. These areas of sin that we allow and we settle for and we fall for, they are relationship killers. 
You just need to know that today. They will stand in the way of you really knowing God. They are lies. They are lies. They are lies that must be recognized and called out and stood up against and replaced with truth. So what do you think about replacing some lies with truth today? Would that be all right? How about the rest of you? Would that be all right? Okay. I so appreciate some of the courses and resources that we offer here at Gateway because they are designed to help you to recognize lies that the enemy wants to use against you and to declare and hold on to and believe and stand in and live out the truth that God speaks in the face of those lies. So those are the lies. Let's take a look at what the truth is. The truth is this. You do not know what's best for your life, but God does. So you need to listen to him. The truth is that God is enough and will always be enough for you in every way imaginable for your life, no matter what. Number three, it is a big deal when you disobey God because it will hinder your relationship with Him and distance you from Him. And there is one thing God wants more than you could ever want and more than anything else in the world, and that is for you to have a close relationship with Him with nothing hindering it. And here's the truth. Your relationship with God is more important than anything or anyone in the entire world. You could never focus on anything more important than that. Now, there may be some people here who are sort of doubting a little bit. You know, they're, they're, you may be thinking, I don't know. I mean, really? Does God really know what's best for me? I mean, will he always truly be enough? You know, I, I'm not sure about all this. Okay, that's, that's fair enough. Okay, I get that. Maybe you're not there yet. I want you to think about something. We, sing, we sang an old hymn for many, many years called Amazing Grace that has in its last verse the opening line, when we've been there, do you know it? Say it with me. When we've been there, how long? 10,000 years. You remember how it goes, right? I mean, you could make that 100,000 years or a million years or 10 million years or 50 billion years, however long you want. But let's pick 10,000 because it's in the song. So let me ask you this. In 10,000 years from now, which no one can even imagine, will these things still be true? Will God still know what's best for you? Will he still be enough for you? Will whether you disobeyed or obeyed him in this life still matter? And will your relationship with him still be more important than anything or anyone else? 10,000 years from now? You bet it will. So if they will still be true then, then I would propose they certainly are true now. And the lies will still be lies then if they are lies now. Don't fall for them. Don't believe them. Believe the truth. Run after God. Get to know him more than anything because he is just waiting for you to do that. When we take a look back many thousands of years to a man named Moses, we see a prayer that he prayed. And we looked at this a year ago and I thought, you know what, I don't want to let go of this. I want to look at it again. Because it's a heartfelt prayer that sort of puts us in a position of need. It puts us in a place where we admit that we need help with this. I need help with this. I'm sure you do too. But Moses prayed a prayer. It's an amazing prayer and it's great for every one of us to pray today. He said this, Lord, if you are pleased with me, teach me your ways so I may know you and continue to find favor with you. Teach me your ways, Lord, so I may know you. Teach me your ways. Teach me what you want. Lord, teach me what you desire. Teach me what your heart is. Teach me your will. Teach me your plans and purposes. Teach me what it means to listen to you. Teach me to recognize truth from lies. Lord, teach me to believe that you know what's best for me. Teach me to know that you truly are enough. Teach me to obey you in all things. Teach me, Lord, that my relationship with you is more important than anything. And teach me above all what it means to really know you so that I may know you. What does this say? This says that knowing God is not just the means to the end. 
it is the end. So many times we, we may approach a relationship in a way that makes sense to us here on earth, but then when we equate that or we compare it to a relationship with God, it's like it doesn't make sense at all. I asked you if you were married earlier, if you would say something to your spouse that would make a very bad day to you for you. Well, think about this. Imagine sitting down to lunch with your spouse today and saying, listen, I just want you to know that I know I should get to know you better and I guess that that's what I want. But really what I want to know is like that's the means, right? The end is what do I get out of this? Like, like really? Like honestly, how is this going to help me and better my life? It's still not going to be a good day for you. And that's true, isn't it? Because we know that knowing that person is the end. It's not just the means to the end. It's also the end itself. It is the reward. Well, why is it that we approach our relationship with God any differently? Why is it that we think, oh yeah, you know, I guess I get to need to know God better. I guess I need to spend more time with Him. I guess I need to do all these things that that pastor talked about on Sunday. But really, what's in it for me? Like, what's the end to that means? That's just a means to get something for me, right? Really? Is that what relationships are truly about? Or is knowing Him the actual reward? Is it the final result? I want to propose to you today that knowing God is not just the means to the end. It is the end itself. And there is nothing that God wants more than that for you. So I'm going to invite you to look at one more thing with me today before we're done. And it's found in Philippians chapter 3. It's some words that the Apostle Paul wrote in his letter to the Philippians as a confession, a declaration, a life statement. And before we finish today, all I'm going to do is read these verses that he wrote. And I'm going to have, we're going to have them up on screen for you to see. And you're going to follow along as we, as we read them and look at them together. But after every statement, I'm going to ask some thought-provoking questions. You're going to have to wrestle with these. They're not going to be things you get to answer today. You know, you might want to look at the video at a later time on our site and just revisit them again and ask some thought-provoking questions that we're going to ask now over and over and over again into this next year until you know that you are settling in your heart and your mind that the desire to know God is greater than anything else in your life. That's a worthwhile pursuit for this year, by the way. So let me read these verses to you from Philippians chapter 3. Paul said, Whatever were gains to me, I now consider loss for the sake of Christ. So I want to ask, what have you gained? What have you accomplished this year? Do you consider your personal gains as actually loss compared to knowing Jesus? Are they more or less important than knowing Jesus? How can you gauge it? How can you know? Paul says, what is more, I consider everything a loss compared to the surpassing worth of knowing Jesus Christ my Lord for whose sake I have lost all things. I want to ask you, what have you lost? I asked you what you gained and now I ask you, what have you lost? Do you consider everything a loss compared to the surpassing worth of knowing Jesus? Now, that sounds kind of radical, doesn't it? it? Sounds a little out there, a little much, but really is it? Have you lost or given or let go of all things for his sake? Or do we still hold tightly to some things, the things of this world, the things that maybe have our hearts just a little too much? Paul goes on. He says, I actually consider them garbage, worthless, that I may gain Christ and be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but having that which is through faith in Christ, the righteousness that comes from God on the basis of faith. And the question is, do I consider, do we consider these things that we normally hold tightly to as actually worthless compared to gaining Christ and being found in him? Like Paul said. Jesus actually said, what will it profit you to gain the whole world and lose your soul? Do we ever believe that somehow we have a righteousness, a good enoughness on our own that comes from just trying or doing our best or trying a little harder, or hoping that it'll be good enough in God's eyes? Or do we have only a righteousness that comes from God through faith in Jesus? I have news for you. That's the only one that matters. Then Paul says this, I want to know Christ. I want to know the power of his resurrection and participation in his sufferings, becoming like him in his death and so somehow to attain to the resurrection of the dead. Now I want to ask you, I got to ask it, 
Do you really want to know Jesus that much? Do you? Do I really want to know the power of his resurrection? Do I really want to know the assurance of my salvation? And I got good news for you. We can. In 2019, our theme, without giving too much away, is going to be rest assured, which is all based on knowing who we believe in and that what he has promised will happen because he is faithful to do what he promised. That means knowing that resurrection life lives in us and it brings life to us, our spirits, our minds, our emotions, our bodies. And the question is, do we really want to know him that much? How about participation in his sufferings? Do we want to identify with Jesus by dying to ourselves and our own desires and our own will? Do we really want to take up the cross that he gives us and follow him daily? Now that word actually means fellowship and intimacy. Now I want you to think about this. You can actually know God better and have a relationship with him through suffering. How many of you have found that to be true? Now how many of you want to get to know God more this year? Maybe that's the way. Do we realize what this leads to? Paul said, I become more like him in both his death and in his resurrection. I am actually counted worthy to experience spiritual resurrection now and physical resurrection when Jesus comes back. And I love how Paul ends this. He actually says, I'm not there yet. I haven't obtained this yet. I have not arrived at my goal. Boy, can I relate to that one. But I will press on to take hold of what Jesus already took hold of for me. I will forget what's behind. I will strain warrant towards what's ahead. I will press on towards the goal to win the prize for which God has called me heavenward in Jesus because that is what God has called us to. So do you realize today what God has called you to? To forget what's, what's behind. No matter whether 2018 was a fantastic year or whether it was a terrible year. Let it go. It pales in comparison to what God has for you to strain towards what's ahead, looking to Jesus, and to press towards the goal. Why? Because God promises you will win the prize, and He has called you to this. So, I hope you had a great year in 2018. Our pastors and leaders at Gateway hope that 2018 was a meaningful and beneficial and life-changing year for now. But do you know what we hope more? We hope that 2019 can be a year of faith and of possibility and of God fulfilling His promises, a year of miracles and a year of following Jesus more than you ever have and a year of seeing God do amazing things in your life and through your life than He ever has before. That's what we're hoping for. That's what we're hoping for. So was 2018 great? Sure, I hope it was. But we hope that in some way, as, as, as it's already been said, that a foundation has been laid for you to move forward in your faith so that as Jesus said, this is eternal life that they know you, the only true God and Jesus Christ whom you have sent. We're going to participate in communion today. And it's worth saying that everything that we have looked at this morning Knowing God, knowing Jesus, surrendering to Him, being found in Christ, experiencing His resurrection, all those things. All of these are made possible by the death and the resurrection of Jesus. And we are going to participate in communion, which really, really is all about knowing Him and knowing each other and being with each other. So I just want to ask you one last question as we, as we move into this time. It's how much do you think Jesus wants you to know Him? You know, he talked in John 6 about partaking of his flesh and of his blood, of hungering and thirsting for him. That brings us right back full circle to the whole issue of appetites. How much do you want to know him? He wants you to hunger for him and to thirst for him and to partake of him and to know him more than anything. So as we participate in communion, I'm going to give you the opportunity just to experience that a little bit together. So I'm going to ask you to get in some groups of families and friends. Please, please, please make sure no one is left out. Please make sure no one is just sitting by themselves. Please invite, include. It was wonderful to see that in the first service. I ask you to do that the same. 
in this service. Invite anyone in who's near you. And let's get into these groups of friends and families. And as the band leads us in a song, one representative from each group, go to either the back table or the front table, whichever is close, close to you, and get a plate and a, and a, uh, a juice with the cups. Bring it back to your group. And then just, uh, you can go ahead and pour the juice or whatever, and then just wait. And then after the song is done, we're going to participate together, and I'll lead you and encourage you and ask you to do a couple other things together, all right? So as the band leads, go ahead and do that. Get in your group, send someone up or back, and get that, and then we'll participate together in a few minutes. Humbly I stand in all free. Well, I hope that you've had enough time just to be able to get that together with your group. Now, I'm going to invite you to do a couple things today before we leave. We only have a few minutes, and you only need really to take a few minutes to do this. But we do want you to just um, feel like you're not pressured. You have as much time as you want. I'm going to invite you, first of all, just to talk to each other for a minute. Don't take a long time each. Just be thoughtful about who gets to share. But just what are you wanting for 2019? about maybe how you want to know God more and why and how. Maybe the purpose of your life and not just a one-year theme. Like, you know, for 2019, how do you want to know God more? Or whatever comes to your mind. And then 
you know, if there's any way that you, you want to say, I need help in this area, or I, I'm struggling with this part, or I, I need God to help me with this part, that's what the body of Christ is for. That's why we're here. We want to be honest with each other. So if we're talking to each other, it's not just, well, here's what I'm, I'm expecting, but also this is what I need help with. And then participate in communion together. I have good news for you. The reason that Jesus' body was broken and, and his blood was shed so, was so that you could have your past and your faults and failures and sins and everything else completely cleansed and wiped away and you'd have a brand new start for 2019. That's the good news. This is why it's possible. So participate in communion together, thanking God, and then just pray for each other quickly. You don't have to take a long time, just do a quick prayer with each other. So just take a few minutes, share a bit, participate in communion a bit, and then pray for each other. And then we'll close our service in a few minutes after you've had time to do this. God bless you.
Well, thank you so much for being a part of our service today. I hope you enjoyed your time with us. And if I'm interrupting, I'm sorry. Feel free to continue in your conversations and your prayers. But I did want to just take a moment on behalf of the staff here at Gateway Church. Wish you a happy new year because we won't get to see you till next year, believe it or not. I hope 2018 was an amazing year for you. But like Pastor Tim has already said, we're believing that 2019 is going to be an even better year. We are believing for the best as yet to come. Again, if you're new here, please feel free to step out into the atrium there. Go to the guest service area and we'd love to give you a gift. But other than that, I have a gift for you right now. Leave the chairs where they're at. You don't have to pack them away. Man, that gets everybody every time. They're like, what? Look at that. Lively, I tell you. We'll see you guys again next week. Bye now.